So I hope you're all doing wonderfully on this weekend. And thank you for all, thank you for all of you to for taking the time to join us today. And it's truly a pleasure to welcome each and every one of you. So welcome to the inaugural event of the Biochem and Biotech Youth Symposium. My name is Emily and I'm a fellow grade 11 student who is interested in biochemistry and molecular biology. And that's also one of the main reasons that I've organized this event today. The purpose of this event is to allow those with similar interests in interdisciplinary biology to share their passion and research, as well as learn about the current cutting edge topics of research in scientific academia. So through this symposium, my hope is that everyone, regardless of their interests, can take away something new and valuable. And I hope to foster an environment of open dialogue, curiosity, and appreciation. So everyone feel free to ask questions or share your thoughts during Q&A sessions. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking, you can also send your questions through the chat. As some of you may know from the program booklet, we'll be first beginning with a 20 minute lecture from Mr. Dan Wong, a PhD candidate in biology from the University of Syracuse. Mr. Wan is a plant molecular scientist with extensive research and teaching experience who is currently researching the mechanisms of plant cell wall form formation and the various internal and external factors which can influence their characteristics. And next, we'll be having five student presenters, six student presenters, to delve into their respective topics of previous research. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Wong. Awesome. So hi everyone. Uh, may I may share my screen for the slides? Yeah. Looks good. Awesome. All right. So hi everyone. And my name is Dan from Syracuse University. And today uh, I will introduce some uh, cutting edge biotechs in biofuel and plant breedings. So uh so here is uh here shows there are three different generations of uh gas we're using now. The first one is the traditional gasoline, and the first generation biofuel is the starch-based biofuel. It can reduce around 43% of gas emission. And the second generation biofuel is the cellulosic biofuel. It means we'll use the cell wall to produce the ethanol for the biofuels. It can reduce 80, uh, 85 to 5% of uh, gas emission. Here's the general process for the uh, biofuel production. At the beginning, we'll harvest the, um, harvest the plants and modeling filter, uh, filtration. And then we'll add some enzyme from different bacteria, different fungi for the fermentation. And after fermentation, uh, the glucose will be uh, be transferred or converts to the ethanol, and ethanol will be uh, purified by distillation and test uh, for the purification. And finally, will mix with gas for the uh, biofuels. So plants can derive fuels and harvest light and it very efficiently and produce the carbon hydrate at high level and can be hydrolyzed and fermented into uh, alcohol fuels or ethanol. And some plants can also can produce the oils and they can made into the biodiesel. Here is the first generation biofuel. So in the first generation biofuel, we will use the uh, corn. It's the star -baged. So we will use the enzyme to degrade it, the starch. It's Starch is part of, uh, it's kind of polysaccharide and to produce the ethanol. Uh, so what's the difference between first and second generation biofuel? Here's the difference. So the first generation biofuel will use the starch. And so there's one organelle in the plant cell is the amyloplast. It's uh, there are a lot of starch inside. But the second, ger second generation biofuel will use the cell wall is the unique outer layers of this uh, plant cells. It's composed of different polysaccharides. So first generation biofuel, where you see corn, it's kind of, it's a potential feed and food sources. But second generation biofuel, we only use the crop residues, perennial grasses or trees. So there's some, uh, 
pros and cons for the uh, second generation Balfour. So let's look at the uh, U.S. domestic corn use in recent uh, decades. Uh, we can see from, from 2020, uh, the total uh, corn use, it, they're stable, but more and more corns were used for the biofuel, not for the feed or, uh, or food source. But for now, there's still a lot of starvation happens in our world. 10 million, of, 10 million of them were children and five of age, and 99 live in low or middle income countries. And 5 million children uh, died due to the uh, undernutrition and related issues. And also the lack of adequate vitamin A kills a million kid, uh, children in a year. And now there are two different uh, hunger. Uh, so chronic hunger globally, 850 million people uh, are chronically hunger, hungry. And also the lack of food source can co cause the anemia. It's uh, also another issue for the uh, food, food security. Uh, as we know, as time, uh, as the temperature was higher, the crop yield will drop. So for now, uh, every one Celsius increase in temperature, the crop yield will decrease or drop three to five percent. And now the global temperature is increasing, as we know. So here is the some. Uh, general background for the cell structure, we can see in pattern A, there are three different, uh, there are two layers of cell wall, primary cell wall and secondary cell wall. And there in secondary cell wall, there are three layers, secondary cell wall one, two, and three. So in pattern B shows the primary cell wall, it's the outer layer of the cells. Uh, it's com composed of uh, cell, uh, cellulose, hemicellulose and pectin. But in secondary cell wall, it composed of cell, uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And okay, here we can see the cell wall uh, structure under the uh, under the microscope. Ce so cellulose is composed of uh, cellulose chain, and hemicellulose is a uh, polysaccharide, and lignin is the recalcitrant po uh, polymer. It means uh, the lignin is really hard to be degraded and they can block the enzyme to uh, digest the cellulose and hemicellulose. And in the second generation biofuel, Poplar will use uh, model organisms. There are four uh, major uh, majority uh, reasons why we use it. Firstly, uh, Poplar has much thicker secondary cell wall uh, compared to other herbaceous plants, it's a woody plant, and it has relatively small genome compared to other woody plants like willow, like mm, larch, and it's also a really widely used biofuel feed, uh, feed store. Here's the uh, geographic to show uh, in the North America, there are different uh, regions uh, have different uh, popular species, but generally they have been uh, widespread in the whole North America. Awesome, so let's move to the biotech in the plants. We can see some green dots, that's the bacteria. There's a kind of bacteria, we call them agrobacteria. In this bacteria, they have a really unique uh, function that is, we call them TI plasmid. So these bacteria can insert TI plasmid, part of TI plasmid into their plant genome. So we don't need to, uh, we can use these uh, characteristics to deliver uh, our gene of interest into the genome. Uh, here is more details about uh, the agrobacteria transformation in plants has been widely used in a lot of species like Raptopsis, uh, like rice, maize, 
including also including the poplar. Generally, uh, we will uh, we will modify or manipulate the TI plasmid, let the plasmid containing part of our gene of interest, and then we will let the agrobacteria with the plasmid to infect the plant cells and uh, agrobacteria will uh, infect the cells and insert the gene of interest into the plant cells. And also we, uh, we were including some uh, selecting markers like some uh, antibiotic resistance genes and some of them into the plant cells. After the cells uh, was be infected by the agrobacteria, we will use some selective media to grow our uh, transgenic, uh, transgenic plants. All right, here we go. We can see uh, here is, we can, uh, and now we're trying to modify the cellulose, hem cellulose, and lignin in, in plants. Here is the example to show when we overexpress uh, when we uh, overexpress or uh, express a lot of or modifies the uh, genes related to the cell cellulose biosynthesis in plant uh, in poplar, especially in poplar. So we can see the left side is the, uh, in pattern A. The left plant is the white type that's control, and right side is three different transgenic lines. We can see they have really uh, significant phenotype, they grow much higher. And on the right side, the uh, microscopy re results shows when we overexpress the cellulose genes, the cell wall thickness increase a lot. And there's another strategy, we can change the hemicellulose content in plants. So just overexpress some genes related to the hemicellulose and we can see the cell wall, uh, secondary cell wall formation will be changed, including the cell wall thickness. It means there will be produced more uh, cell walls for the biofuel uh, production. And also we can try to decrease the lignin content in plants because as we mentioned, as I mentioned before, the lignin is a recalcitrant polymer. They just, uh, they cannot be uh, fermented because there are a lot of phenol uh, residues inside. So we try to knock down or knock out the genes related to the lignin synthesis. Mm, usually for knockdown or knockout, we use RNAi or RNA interference or CRISPR. And also, we have another strategy to modify the cell wall. Like we can introduce some exogenesis gene uh, in cell wall. From here, we can see uh, some of G uh, hyperthermal enzyme from fungi has been introduced into the plant genome and expressed in cell wall. And we can see once the cell, um, once the uh, hyperthermal enzyme was introduced into the, into the popular cell wall, they can release much more glucose after the heat treatment, just put them into, into the oven for 30 minutes and the enzyme will digest the cell, digest the cell wall for us. All right. Mm. And also the plant, uh, there are also a lot of plant uh, productivity issues like biotic stress. Um, for example, the hit, um, fungi or some insect uh, infection and abiotic stress like heat stress, cold stress, salt stress, drought stress, and nutrient and water use, use efficiency and nutrient level and spoilage. For the breeding strategies to improve the drought tolerance, they have been uh, we're trying to figure out. And here's some examples in, rap, uh, in Raptopsis and um, uh, in Raptopsis. Yeah, so from the left side, we can see 
uh, the Y type and the mutant, the Y type only have a really short uh, root because the drought because of drought stress will inhibit the movement. But on the right side, we can see the uh, why, uh, the transgenic lines, like we modified genes related to the drought stress, they can grow much longer or stronger roots than the Y type. It means when we modify the cell, uh, when we modify the related to the drought stress, it can improve the drought top. Mm, here's the here's the same. Uh, just more examples. Uh, we have well waters and have a uh, ten days and twenty days drought, and then we after rewatering, we can see the white type cannot survive after the droughts stress, but the transgenic lines can 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 recover. Can be recovered. For now, uh, we have some genetic improvements in agriculture. Mm, so. For example, the distant path in the distant uh, path uh, is the crop plant domestication beyond. But for the recent years, there are more uh, new tech has been used for the uh, breeding, for the crop breeding or plant breeding, like hybrid seeds, and also also the first uh, green revolution. So first uh, green revolution is uh, that we discovered some genes uh, related to the phyto hor hormone and they can mm, increase the yield and increase the uh, length of the stem. So if, if, for example, if the rice or maize have much higher stem, they cannot resist the wind, they, they will just fall down. And now, or in the future, we have uh, some breeding strategies for improved uh, human health, breeding strategies for the abiotics and biotic stress. We call them uh, second green revolution. From here, we have some advanced in genetic tech can tr contribute to improved plants like bunker resistance selection, genome-wide association study, and recom recombinant gene tag and transgenic plants, and also the cis gene and intra uh, genet uh, genics and transgrafting and precision genome editing. From here, I introduce one uh, genome or genetic modif modification examples. It's related to the disease resistance. Uh, around, mm, around, Twenty around fifteen years ago, uh, the scientists find a uh, disease resistant genes in pepper specifically, and then the scientists clone that genes and transfer these genes to the banana, and let the banana can resist some uh, specific disease. That's reason why we can get some bananas for now, because banana is, the majority of banana for now is the asexual uh, reproduction, means they uh, technically they're the same, they're from the same parents of the world. So once the gene can uh, affect the banana and the, all the bananas in the world will be, will be destroyed. Uh, and now we have more uh, efficient and uh, ch cheaper um, gene editing tools like CRISPR. So about three or four years ago, the Nobel Prize uh, awarded to the CRISPR. Um, and now CRISPR can be used for the bio plan, uh, uh, plant biotech and application in food industrial and also this tech has been used for the human disease. As we know, um, uh, recently, the first CRISPR-related uh, um, drugs has been approved by FDA. 
All right, so that's it. Uh, feel free, free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wong. Um, I'll give the chat and the audience a minute or two if anyone has any questions. Um, well, I have a question. Um, do you have any advice that you would give to fellow high school students who also want to do like experimental research or research into um plants and Biochemistry. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, because uh, before we uh decide which uh organisms will or which direction aspect we want to uh, learn in the future, the most important is to learn some basic stuff, like uh, uh take some course like um, uh, cell biology, molecular biology, and biochemistry. They are all re related. So, uh, once you got some basic uh, background about how, uh, how, what's the cell respiration? What's the photosynthesis? And that will help you to, uh, apply different labs in the future. Mm. And also, I know some universities they will provide uh, some summer uh, opportunity, summer opportunities for the high school student like my lab day. Uh, some high school student will just come to my our labs and do some basic stuff like how to do the PCR how to extract RNA, how to extract DNA, it will help you a lot to explore which uh which part you want you are which part you want to do in the future. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the response. So if there are no more questions, we can move on to student presentations. First up is Jolene, who unfortunately could not make it today. So I'll be playing a pre-recorded video that she has made. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat along with your email, and I'll be happy to relay them to Jolene. Hi everyone, my name is Jolene Wong, and I'm a high school senior in Los Angeles, California. With an interest in biochemistry, I've been researching hunting and in September 2023. The presentation today focuses on such research, exploring mutants and relative hemogenic disparities in Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a neurological genetic condition causing the degeneration of nerve cells or neurons. The disease is named after George Huntington. Described some families of core form mutants in 1872 that are now associated with Huntington's disease. The disease affects around 30,000 individuals in the United States, most of which are adults in their 30s and 40s. Its symptom profile includes difficulty in controlling movements, emotional disturbances, and cognitive disability. The fatality period is 20 years after symptoms start to appear in affected patients, and the disease lacks an effective long term treatment. In fact, most developing technologies are in preclinical development and may be abandoned due to adverse side effects once they reach clinical trials. This is an urgent issue within healthcare, and new treatments can only be found by focusing on the root cause of the disease, a dysfunctional molecular structure. With this aim, researchers have previously found that Huntington's disease is due to mutations consisting of excessive repeats of the CAG trinucleotide codon, with a chemical basis in the order cytosine, adenine, and guanine and chromosome pair four out of the 23 pairs in the human body. In people with Huntington's disease, the CAG segment is repeated 36 to more than 120 times. People with 40 or more repeats almost always develop the disorder, and children who pre present symptoms associated with the disease most commonly have more than 50 repeats. The codon repeats form a feature known as a poly 2 tract, a protein section with units of amino acids called glutamine. The excessive repeats create an extended polycule link, leading to the protein Huntington misfolding. Misfolded proteins accumulate in clusters called macroaggregates, targeting striatal neurons in the basal ganglia. Normal Huntington regulates neuronal and glial functions, 
the mutated HTT or MHTT disrupts forebrain development crucial for the planning and execution of movements, sensory processing, and processing of information. Mutated Huntington also decreases the survival of neurons past synaptic pruning in the adult forebrain. The higher the number of CAG repeats, the more severe the symptoms and the earlier the onset of Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is an inherited disorder and is autosomal dominant. This means that the disease affects an autosome or non-sex chromosome and cannot be masked. Currently, treatments attempting to alleviate Huntington's disease symptoms are RNA interference and antisense oligonucleotide therapies. RNA interference uses cellular machinery to process RNA molecules and label the target mRNA for degradation, which inhibits protein synthesis and ensures that mutated proteins do not accumulate. Antisense oligonucleotide therapies Increase the range of targetable RNA sequences by binding to mRNA and pre mRNA, altering protein expression by blocking, splicing, and translating the mRNA. These are undergoing clinical trials to test for clinical safety. The aim of my research paper is to highlight trends in Huntington's treatment progression and to inform readers of the need for further molecular biophysical research on this disease. As stated before, Huntington's disease lacks an effective and safe treatment. Due to a huge issue for HP patients that urgently calls for research. I conducted literature reviews on transcriptional regulation, biotype HTT protein structure, interactions of HTT with modulators such as HAP40, mutant HTT structure, and current treatments of HP. To find primary research articles, I used the keywords Huntington's disease, Huntington, molecular expansion, protein aggregation, and neurodegeneration. I primarily use databases such as PubMed for papers and UCSF Chimera and Protein Database for 3D imaging of Huntington and its interactions with modulators. My research suggests that the expanded polyky region is the main structural difference between mutated HTT and HTT, causing mutated HTT aggregation and altered interactions with the Huntington associated protein 40 or HAT40, which typically stabilizes the conformation of HTT. In complex of HTT, HAP40 tightly binds to HTT with a smaller bridge domain that connects the two. This causes exacerbated symptoms of HD. The safety profile of drugs tested in clinical trials presents challenges. In the limited administration of drugs through cerebral spinal fluid to cross the blood brain barrier creates a limited range of potential treatments. The promising trend lies in gene editing applications such as mismatch repair, which can manipulate excess CAG codons and inhibit repeat expansions. This will limit expanded polyky tracks and lead to the reduction of HTT misfolds. In conclusion, further research on structural differences between MHTT and HTT is crucial to push the boundaries of HD treatments currently focusing on HD's transcription rather than MHTT interactions. It's been shown that HAP4 modulators can stabilize MHTT, but more research is required to focus on these applications for effective treatments. Further treatments align focus on structural MHT and HTT mechanisms may prove to be more effective. Still, findings are essential to acknowledge for all audiences in favor of increasing the lifespan, managing the symptom profile, and improving the daily life of HD patients. Some future research questions could be what future treatments can be developed to target MHT interactions, and what is necessary for the clinical safety and improved effectiveness of current mismatch repair. I believe the trend of Huntington's disease research was skewed towards treatments, especially due to the urgency and fatality rate of this disease. Future research should also focus on reducing MHT protein levels through targeting mRNA. I'd also like to conduct future research on the hereditary development of HD and potential prenatal gene therapies. Thank you for listening to my presentation on the structural differences between MHT and HT and its impact on current HD treatments. Yeah, so thank you um, to Jolene. And if you guys have any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. So now I'll be moving on to our second speaker, who is Jessica, who will be talking about the applications of gyroelectrophoresis in cancer research. Hi, um, so I'll share my screen. Um, 
one second. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about the use of gel electrophoresis in the study and detection of cancer. So gel electrophoresis is a relatively new um, method of uh, separating DNA fragments. Um, it's part of the biotech industry, which is, as we know, an emerging industry. Um, so gels are basically there. It's a slab of um, a it's a, it's a polymer like material that's similar to agar and it has a like gummy like consistency. Um, and it's uh made of entangled polymers, and um, you take DNA and you load it into rectangular wells that are at the top of the gel, um, usually using like a micro pipette. And um, an electric current is added to the gel, um, usually using a power source. And um, one side of the gel is connected to a cathode, which is positively charged. And the other side is connected to an anode, which is negatively charged. And this allows the DNA to be separated by fragment size. Um, because you sh because the, um, the charge difference in the gel um, allows uh, some of the fragments to move towards one end while some will kind of stay towards the other end. Um, so DNA is a negatively charged molecule and that's due to the phosphate group, uh, which is a functional group that is found in DNA. Um, and because it's negatively charged, um, it wants to, the, the fragments will want to move towards the um, the positively charged side because positive and negative will attract. Um, and the shorter DNA fragments will typically have an easier time making their way through the gel because um, the tangle of polymers um, can sometimes uh, cause the larger molecule, the larger fragments to get stuck. Um, so the shorter the shorter fragments will move further along the gel and um, and usually um, we'll let it run until um, until there's a clear difference in where the fragments have made it to, um, but not so far that they make it all the way to the end of the gel. And as far as cancer uh, detection, so some um, some protein samples or DNA samples can be marked with dyes. Um, and when you when you run them through the gel, they will fluoresce. Um, one of them is called 2D Dij, and it's basically just a marker, like a dye. Um, and once you add them to the proteins, when the when the gel has finished running, um, they will cause the fragments that have the dye um, to be easier to spot because typically the uh, gels will have multiple rows um, and each row will represent like a different um, a different group uh, typically with the first row being um, like a standard group to compare back to and uh, so once the gel is run the cancer genes will fluoresce while the benign ones will not because they uh, they won't have the correct um, protein uh, the correct dye on them. And uh, once the gel has completely run, so the DNA fragments will be separated by size with the shorter fragments uh, towards the bottom of the gel because they were able to get there faster. And the larger fragments will be towards the top of the gel because they, they won't have moved as much. And typically, every gel is different, but um, the they are usually measured, the length of the fragment is measured in base pairs. Um, so the top of the gel could be um, the longer fragments, which could be, you know, up to some of them, sometimes they're like a thousand base pairs. Um, and then the bottom of the gel will have the, the much shorter fragments, which could be like a hundred or 200 base pairs, or maybe even smaller. 
And cancer genes will be isolated from the other genes. And if they are marked, they'll be easier to find because um, sometimes they, the fragments can kind of all look very similar. These gels are a little bit difficult to read if, if it isn't made clear what to look for. And uh, gels can also show the size of a particular gene relative to other genes, which may be helpful as well because gels are also used in other fields of uh, biotech, um, such as like DNA testing. Um, so for example, um, to test if two people are related, sometimes they'll do uh, they'll run a gel with um, one person, one person's DNA being compared to another. Um, and seeing if the lengths of their uh, fragments line up, because that could um, indicate a relationship between those two people genetically. And um, so these gels are revolution revolutionizing the field of cancer biology because they're making it much easier to spot um, these types of uh, cancer genes with the markers like 2 d 2DDG. Um, and the isolation of DNA fragments containing specific genes is useful in trying to pick out cancer genes because if they're marked, they'll, they'll be much easier to find. And when they're separated by size, we can uh, compare them to uh, known sizes of cancer genes to see if they match up. And as far as questions from the future, um, I would like to find out if these biomarkers can be used to identify different types of cancer. So um, if a, if it would be, if we would be able to differentiate, you know, um, lung cancer genes from skin cancer genes, um, like how, if the DNA fragments are uh, different lengths for each or how we could uh, use gels to kind of differentiate them. And does it matter how, how far the cancer has developed before it is run through the gel? Will that affect um, the way the gel is run at all or how the markers work. And what other biomarkers can be used if 2D Dej and 2D Page are unavailable? So um, like I said, 2D Dej is just a uh, type of dye and then 2D Page is um, the type of gel that 2D Dej works well with. So if those are unavailable or um, don't work for a specific type of um, a sp specific type of DNA, then what else can we use? Because um, it's not always great to have only one way of doing things. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, again, I'll give a minute or two for anyone who may want to ask questions. Awesome. May I have a question? Sure. Yeah, nice. Great work, Jessica. and. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, I thought uh, one con uh, confused is that we know one gene got mutated. It could be just one or two base pairs uh, change, right? Yes. Uh, in the genome. So if you, uh, the two D uh, tag can detect this one or two base pair mutation or no? I don't think that it would be helpful in detecting just one or two base pairs because I think when it's run through the gel, um, typically they aren't the, um, how far the fragments travel isn't, you can't see it down to like single base pairs. Um, you, you wouldn't see a difference between a fragment that's like 250 base pairs versus 251. Um, I think it would be more like you'd see a difference between, you know, 200 and 700. Um, so if we wanted to see a change in a single base pair, I think it, it would be better to send the fragment in for sequencing um, and actually see what the base pairs are and then uh, compare it to a known gene to see uh, what has changed or what type of uh, mutation took place. Yeah. Awesome. That, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Wonderful. Thank you for asking the question, Mr. Wong. Thank you for your answer, Jessica. So if no one else has any questions, we can move on to Rosalie, next speaker, 
who will be talking about her biology journey and some of her research into cancer genes and cancer therapies. Thank you, Emily, for inviting me. Um, I'll just be sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosaline, and so nice to be able to talk today. Um, so what I'll be doing in this is kind of talking about my biology journey and how I kind of led to my research about cancer genes and also kind of providing some resources for you guys if you guys are interested in pursuing this kind of research and also some resources if you'd like to learn more. So first on my biology journey, I kind of started with um, my friend's cancer diagnosis was started in grade six, and basically she was diagnosed with leukemia, which is a type of blood cancer. And so that kind of spurred me to do my research about cancer genes, because as you guys probably know and are interested about, um, biotech is an emerging industry, and research about cancer genes is especially important because um, seeing which cancer genes can be manipulated with the gene therapies that people before have talked about. Um, that's kind of like my area of interest. And I'm also going to be talking about um, some other stuff later. Okay, so what are tumor suppressor genes exactly? I decided to do P53 and P10 because those are the main ones. Um, the principle of them is they're basically a family of proteins created by TP53 or P10. Um, and then stem cell gene therapy is like the um, basically, as you can see in this picture, you kind of have stem cells, which are kind of like um, blank slates, and then you are able to put kind of genes or they adapt to become specific types of cells. And so having this kind of gene put into um, stem cells is able to make these cells like more um, resistant to cancer, for example, if you are able to put the gene in um, when it's a stem cell. So then in the future, when it multiplies, it's not going to have as much risk. Okay, so basically the process is kind of you take stem cells from the parents, patient's bone marrow, and then you add the DNA into the cells, and then you inject them into the patient, and there's a more detailed process. However, like currently, it's still like the vast, vast majority is still in progress, so mostly of my research is still in theory, um, but a lot of research has been done so far. Okay, so for some general information, they're the most commonly mutated um, tumor suppressor genes, and, but it's kind of rare to find them both mutated in the same tumor. And sometimes like they'll even still carry normal ones and the functions of these two genes are linked together. So I was interested in seeing like what specific role um, each of these individual genes plays in the body. For example, if we have a patient who is very like immunosuppressed um, and we need to only be able to make one choice about which gene to put into the patient, um, kind of comparing the role of these two and seeing which one would be the better option is kind of like the goal of my research. Okay, so for some information about P53, it's a prime molecule in repressing effects, and it's essential for regulating DNA repair and cell division like some other genes. Um, the cell cycle is kind of regulated by a lot of proteins and enzymes and like regulatory pathways. And P53 plays a major role in regulating cancer, which is basically unregulated cell growth. And it's a transcriptional activator, which helps to bring help to growth arrest, DNA repair, and apoptosis, which is basically um, self-programmed cell death. And it kind of acts like a mass messenger. So kind of the roles of it um, in simple terms is that first, um, it can be directly involved in DNA repair um, or um, has apoptosis roles. It basically initiates that or it has growth arrest, which means it stops cell cycle progression and basically stops it there. And then when it feels that it's um, not going to mutate anymore or the mutation is fixed, then it's going to move on to the next stage of the cell cycle. So some basic characteristics of P53 oh, um, is basically that um, you can see that it has a large role in aging because um, in this study, for example, they showed the results of those in mice where they basically altered the P53 levels. And they were showing that high levels of it can actually lead to aging, um, like accelerated aging, which is not good. Um, and it can also be damaged easily by almost anything, for example, um, 
outside um, sunlight or UV rays, and it can also be damaged easily by almost anything, for example, at least, and then it leads to increased likelihood that a cell will begin uncontrolled cell division, leading to more tumors and cancers. So that's kind of why it's really important to be able to figure this thing out. And so kind of the three plausible links that are kind of applied to P53, like in a broader sense, is that first of all, like DNA repair is largely connected to the aging process. And both of these proteins are thought to have something to do with P53. And in mice with intact P53, there was like crit critically shortened telomeres. And telomeres are basically the ends of the chromosomes that keep everything together. So telomeric shortening often leads to organ failure and chronic diseases. And in mice, you can see that these critically um, shortened telomeres can actually be helpful in restricting cancer. And although they may have some disorders, um, but P53 kind of determines whether these short telomeres will be sensed, um, leading to either like prematurely aged mice or ignored like tumor prone animals, which obviously you want the first one, like if you had a choice. And without P53 telomeric shortening, um, would also be no longer an efficient anti-cancer mechanism, which is kind of important because cancer is something that impacts a lot of people. And once it starts, it's going to be very hard to combat in a way. So um, the main goal of this research was kind of to find um, the roles of this. And P53 is mainly used for detecting these telomeres, for example, or initiating um, DNA repair or the growth arrest and apoptosis that I talked about before. So now on to the other gene about P10. Um, this is kind of like a summary of the basic information. So it's basically um, one of the only known examples of a lipid phosphate um, with bona fide tumor suppressive activity. So it's pretty essential and it's localized to the nucleus and primarily located in the cytoplasm. Um, and it's very dependent actually on cell cycle stage. Um, but however, it's a long lived and stable protein in normal cells. Um, so what does it specifically do to help the body? Um, it's very important tumor suppressor, and when it's deleted in mice, several serious tumors came up in many places, and it also provides a link that leads to cytoskeletal uh, reorganization. And the cytoskeleton is basically um, how the organelles and whatnot in the cell are able to be organized. They kind of provide a structure for that. And it basically also controls the size of the entire animal by regulating cell growth. So it's pretty important, um, similar to other tumor suppressor genes. So the cons of it, um, the main impacts that we see are it's one of the most frequently mutated and it's more likely to mutate than P53. There's many studies in the world that show that. And if it mutates, it contributes to the development of cancer, obviously. And if P10 is completely lost, actually, it leads to more severe cancers. And However, there are like many regulatory mechanisms as well that actually counteract it and disrupt the P10 function and may actually like promote getting more cancer. So P10 is incredibly risky. Um, so now for some discussion about other treatments that I've um, thought about in the past, for example, um, during grade six, I did this project on CAR T cell therapy and some other biotech things that I thought would be kind of interesting to introduce to all of you. Um, so what CAR T cell therapy is, it's an immunotherapy that involves manipulation of immune cells or of patients to attack and recognize the tumor. So tumors have uh, tumors and normal cells have antigens which are basically like a recognizing feature um, of the cell. And then you can see um, that with these T cells, if you program them to have a certain antigen, they'll be able to recognize these tumors, kind of like after you get sick, your T cells are kind of like um, more programmed to be able to recognize in the future and be able to target it right away so it doesn't get as worse. Um, so that's kind of the main um, methodology behind CAR T cell therapy. So not only the tumor cells express the antigen, um, but the activation of CARs actually rapidly increase the level of inflammatory cytokines. So that's kind of like the main side effect, which is still like something that researchers are still working hard on to reduce. And cytokine release syndrome um, causes like high fever and whatnot because your body has to raise the temperature to fight off those cytokines. So that's kind of where it is at now. So the next thing I would like to talk about is about gene therapy and hemo 
hematopoietic um, stem cells. And these specific type of stem cells are actually um, shown to have high potential for longevity and capacity for cell renovation. So it's kind of like a combination between gene therapy and stem cell. And it's really interesting because um, the production of these gene transfer vectors for the creation of some specific stem cells um, could lead to um, allowing like a resistance to reinfection because they have a short RNA, which means that it help, could help a lot of people in the future, like not just in cancer, but also um, immune diseases. So kind of like conclusion about what I found out from my research, um, P53 appears to be the superior treatment method for the following reasons. Um, P10 is kind of like independent and it's not replaceable. And P53 on its own is like an important downstream meditator of um, P13K pathway. And the negatives of them are kind of like, there's two main syndromes that are caused by mutations, which would be incredibly risky if you added more of them. Um, the first is P10 harmatoma syndrome, um, which is basically where you have these harmatomas, which are like non-benign uh, tumors kind of. And for P53, it accelerates the aging process and side effects mainly come from leaf or many syndrome, which is basically where um, someone only has one copy of P53 in their cells and the normals too. So for the combination, I guess, um, overall conclusion, the P13K pathway is something that must be regulated. And while P10 may be independent, it has various conditions associated with it, as well as a high mutation rate. So overall, P53 would be more effective at least damaging compared to P10. So um, in the future, P53 might be a more effective option used in this kind of gene therapy. Okay, so kind of for resources and what I encourage you all to do in the future, if you're interested in um, learning more about research in general or pursuing a field of STEM, because as a student myself, I found a lot of difficulty finding um, resources, for example, and sometimes I often read journals through the cell paper and whatnot, but it's often like has a lot of um, terms that might not be familiar to you, or it's often very hard to read. So kind of what's the thing I started from my reset through Silicon Valley, I found that there was a lot of gender inequality um, there. And I founded the Women in STEM Club, which is certainly currently still a school-based club, but we're hoping to expand that. And our mission is kind of to like empower and inspire young women and kind of help in education as well. So we've also um, done some like career exploration, community outreach, guest speakers and study groups. And I have some like, resources already prepared. If any of you would like that, um, I can ask Emily to send like your email or something. And I'd be happy to send some resources to all of you. And also if if you guys are interested at all in other things, for example, I know there's data camp, which talks about kind of like computer science, which is used a lot in um, biotech because you need a lot of analyzing data. And there's also other resources, for example, um, if you're interested in war models, I do know a bit about that. Um, there's some um, places where you can order strains, which basically um, come with worms that have specific strains of genes. For example, they have already a mutation in P53, which was incredibly helpful to my research. Um, so if any of you guys are interested in that, um, feel free to get in touch. That's my email. And thank you so much, um, especially to Emily. Thank you so much, Rosie, for your amazing presentation. Um, and again, yeah, I'll um, definitely, if anybody has wants like any of the resources or wants to connect with Rosie, feel free to email me or Rosie. Um, I'll put my email in the chat later. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hello, I'm again. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Uh Great job, and it's really fascinating, and I'm really curious about the CAR T cell therapy. So, um, because we know, uh, as you mentioned in, in your uh, in your presentation, uh, CAR T cell therapy is trying, uh, it's trying to cure the uh, leukemia. It's kind of blood cancer. So, if I uh, could tell me if there's any uh applications for the CAR T cell therapy that can target to some uh, real tumor like lung cancer, stomach cancer, pancreas cancer, or even brain cancer? 
Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, CAR T cell therapy is pretty important to blood cancer because a lot of um, the blood cancer, the cancer can travel through the blood and go to the various sites. So that's kind of why um, I touched about blood cancer, but it's used widely. Um, it's kind of still in the clinical trial stage because it's pretty recent. It's only been um, really introduced three years ago. And, um, but it's still used a lot in other cancers, for example, solid tumors, although it may be a bit hard for on the immune system to only use this kind of treatment because CAR T cell therapy, like the T cells have to act on the tumor. And if it really is very big and solid, um, it's kind of hard for the immune system to tackle that in the first place. So um, it's pretty useful um, because you're able to prevent it in the first place. And also um, it's kind of like consistent. So um, that's kind of what it's kind of used for. And it can definitely be used for solid cancers, but it's usually used in combination then. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, also, I think you talked, Rosalind, you talked about some, um, that you faced a lot of like obstacles and challenges during your journey. Um, could you expand on that a little bit and perhaps like how did you overcome those challenges? Yeah, so my school currently doesn't really have a lot of lab resources. And often I find that um, in school, we don't really learn about gene regulation. For example, gene regulation is a topic in AP biology and it's kind of something that um, is relatively new. Um, so I faced a lot of challenges when I started in grade six doing my cancer research and science fair projects um, that I had to look through journals. And because I didn't have a lot of lab resources, um, we decided to just start with um, a literature review. And I encourage you to guys to try that if you don't have a lot of um, laboratory resources, because a literature review is kind of like a good way to get introduced into the field and see if you're really interested. Um, I did my literature review in the first time on CAR T cell therapy um, versus bone marrow transplant and seeing which one would be more effective for um, leukemias. So I often, you can find a lot of journals online, um, for example, Cell or Scientific American. And there's often a lot of, um, for example, my school has some um, subscriptions that are available throughout the whole school and then you are able to kind of sign in but there's also a lot of public access ones that you can download and see what's interested for example just search up some keywords on the website and then you can find um, like go through the article see what's interested you can first look at the abstract and if that's something that you want to look through um, download the pdf and then um, for like words or whatnot, you can like search them up one by one. It's time consuming, but it usually kind of works out. You can kind of piece it together yourself. And another thing that I found helpful was I reached out to some experts on the field. And usually if you um, search up um, your area of interest or what you're searching on on Google, and then you'll find some experts who perhaps written a research paper that you read or um, are currently doing some like blogs or um, talking about their research online, you can reach out to them because their email is usually accessible on their faculty website. And then I found that helpful. And th you can like email them about some questions. And they're usually very um, open to talking to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Rosling? All right, so moving on, we are going to have Susie, who was also cannot make it today. So I'll be playing a pre-recorded video again. And same thing, if you have any questions for Susie, I will be happy to relay them to her. Hi everyone, so I'll talk about the biochemistry club I founded uh, in the Wasa Shanghai Academy, the high school I'm in, and some mini biochemistry experiment we have conducted, and also our future plans. So this presentation may be different from others because our lab isn't as formal, and we also face many limitations here in China. So 
um, this presentation is solely to give some insight about um, the clubs here in China. So first I'll talk about the club organization. So I'm the club leader, obviously. And then underneath we have four branches. So the first one is the experiment leader. So she's responsible for planning the experiment and also making some mini quizzes for the club members. Then we have the advertising leader. So she is responsible for converting the lab reports into language that are easier to understand uh, and post that on our website. Then we have the finance leader. So he's responsible for um, collecting all the funds and also keeping track of our spending. Finally, we have the website constructing leader. So he's responsible for constructing the website as well as maintaining it. So the fundraising process is actually um, more easier than I thought it would be. We received a lot of support from our peers, our parents, and also our school. So here are some posts about um, our experiments that were on the Wasa Shanghai Academy account. So this is one of the uh, experiments we've done on the Winter Showcase and also the bull eye dissection. Um, here's our website. Um, if you feel interested, if you uh, if you feel interested, you can go check with this link. Uh, and now I'll introduce the many experiments we've conducted. So the first one is bullfrog dissection. Um, it is very different from others because um, in China we don't have bullfrogs ready for dissection. We only have bullfrogs for cooking, obviously. So I bought all the bullfrogs from market, and we first have to make it unconscious or dead before dissection. So the methodology includes air drawing using baking soda stabbing CNS and using vinegar. So I divided our club members into four teams, each using one of the methods. So for, for air drawing, we decided to uh, plug a needle into the uh, arola of the frog. However, since the frog kept on struggling, uh, it's difficult to locate this arola and the attempt eventually failed. Then we have the baking soda. So some researchers said that um, baking soda will ulcerate uh, the bullfrog skin so that it will die in a few minutes, but it doesn't work in our lab at least. Um, then about uh, stabbing with CNS, it is the most effective method among all four. Um, after stabbing with CNS, the frog imme immediately stops moving um, and is ready for dissection. Finally, we have um, vinegar. So we put the bullfrog in a beaker and use this as a covering uh, to prevent it from jumping out. Uh, vinegar actually took a long time, like uh, seven to eight minutes, but it actually worked. Next, we have um, DNA extraction from strawberries. Here is the methodology. So finally, we could visualize DNA through the eye. So in terms of the reason behind it, so since strawberry has eight pairs of chromosome compared to uh, two pairs of chromosome that we have, so it makes it easier to see with naked eye. Also the physical smashing process here um, helps destroy its cell wall and probably maybe uh, some membrane also nuclear envelopes. Then we add detergent to bind to the hydrophobic end of the cell membrane, breaking the bio layer. Um, then we have salt that removes protein from DNA, also neutralizing DNA's negative charge. So when alcohol is added, DNA is likely to precipitate. Um, and also alcohol helps reduce foaming and remove the salt previously added. Finally, the filtering process um, helps the solution to obtain um, as less fragments as possible. Um, and these fragments could include um, the cell wall destroyed, the cell membrane, or the proteins. Next one is a custom mode experiment. It is a three week duration experiment, the longest um, that we have conducted yet. So the process of it is um, first we activate the bacteria by putting it into a uh, moisture environment um, shown here. 
Um, then we blend some cereal uh, into small pieces as food sources for bacteria. And we can see that in two days, um, the bacteria is activated and start eating up cereals. However, um, because we didn't have a sterile dish or a sterile uh, environment in our lab, we removed the activated bacteria into the azure, um, some of the moses start to grow, and um, it kind of overrule the whole azure dish. So um, the bacteria eventually died. Um, then we have the flame test experiment. So um, the process is about living up the cotton sulfurous ethanol with carbon powders on them. Um, so the ethanol and carbon are used for assisting burning. However, the carbon will also affect um, the color of, all the, of the flames. This is one of the limitations. Um, and orange flames appear with when iron is burned, green flames appear when copper is burned, and white or like silver flames appear when magnesium is burned. So these are, these are some pictures took by the advertising team. So the reason for the diversifying colors you see here is because after um, observing all these colors, we mix all the uh, metals we have together and see this diversifying awesome color. Next we have uh, the luminar experience. Finally, we have the artificial blood experiment. This is the chemical equation for that. And these are some funny uh, kind of applications of the fake blood. Um, finally, we actually uh, combined these two experiments together because Lumino could detect the iron inside blood. So we want to see that uh, because like Lumino can detect the iron in hemoglobins in uh, human blood or like pig blood. So we also also want to see if we could detect the artificial blood we make. It also contains iron, um, and as a result, it could detect. So in conclusion, even though we face some original barriers, for example, if we're going to buy a three percent hydrogen peroxide, we have to pretend that we are sick. We have some disease in our um, ears or something, and we have to get um, the hydrogen peroxide as a prescription medicine which is kind of weird. And we also have got something from the doctors just to prove that we are um, sick. And also, uh, we didn't have the sterile dish as I mentioned before, so there are some limitations of the equipment. Finally, we don't have bull frogs for experiment use or dissection use. Despite all these barriers, um, the club really is an entertainment, is a relax of all the academic work because it improves my uh, and also improve my leadership skills and having that same goal with others and having the same interest um, of bio and talking, communicating with them, um, it's really enjoying. So in terms of future work, uh, I plan to do the enzyme activity, seeing how pH and temperature affect enzyme activity, um, and also do a data collection. Um, this is kind of a a uh, new thing to us because we've done many experiments, but we haven't do any kind of data collection. We want to do many samples to make sure that our data is accurate and to really uh, repeat several processes to make it really feel like we are in a real lab um, doing some contributions. Next, we uh, will do the fundraising process. We run out of money after the winter showcase by our school. Finally, uh, we will do a cooperation with Pinku and Tinku One. They are all famous international schools here in Shai, uh, Shanghai. We will do an academic discussion around probably DNA. Um, it will be this winter. Um, thanks. That's all my presentation. Because I'm not there online um, due to the time zone, you can contact me through this email address. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susie. So again, if anyone has questions for Susie, feel free to um, contact her by email or you can contact me and I can send the questions to her. Hi, everyone. So
Let me. I'll put her. I'll put her email in the. They're online. Chat right now. And here is my email if you guys have any questions as well. So now let's move on to Suri, uh, who will be talking to us about the use of CDT4 T cells in ICV cancer treatment. Hi. Oh, I'm having some problem with my camera. Okay, failed. So uh, maybe I will not be able to like turn on my camera. Oh, that, that's okay. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I have a CDT. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's very interesting. Beijing time zone, so it's now four in the morning, and uh, I'm also very surprised that a lot of people is considering about uh cancer treatment and some immunosystem stuff. So uh, I'm very proud that I'm also one of them. So today I'm going to talk about uh immunosystem versus uh tumor cells, which is a very interesting research paper about uh, the CD4 plus T cells in ICD cancer treatment that I have read the research paper uh, in June last, last year. Okay. So as we know, there are two kinds of T cells in the cell-mediated immunity. So the first type is called CD8 plus T cells, or uh, the cytotoxic T cells. It can uh, work to destroy the tumor cells or the antigens uh, directly through cytokinesis, which is uh, secreting some kind of protein that can uh, directly like destroy and uh, to break down the uh, tumor cells. It is activated by a protein called MHC type 1. So this is uh, refers to the major histocompatibility complex which is an antigen that exists on almost all the cells that can trigger immune response and must be recognized by the CD8 plus T cells so that it can work to like work as soldiers to uh, destroy the tumor cells. And as we can see in the right pictures, uh, the green sticks on uh, the purple cells are the MHC molecules. That is works like the acceptors that can like combine to the antigen fragment and be recognized by the CD8 plus T cells. So the other type of T cells is called CD4 plus T cells, also called the helper T cells. Uh, it is called helper because we used to think that it can only help the maturation of lymphocytes and can like it can only work like a messenger to help deliver the information from the antigen to the CD8 plus T cells. And it's activated by MHC type 2. So like in the research paper, the researchers found a new ability of the CD4 plus T cells. It uh, not only works as helpers to deliver messages, but can also help to indirectly cue the tumor cells. So um, I'm also going to like talk about the uh, original immune checkpoint blockage treatment so that we can better link to why the new research can like improve the effectiveness of these ICB treatments. So like ICB treatment's main purpose is to increase the CD8 plus T cells activity in killing the tumor cells. So like in our body or in our immune system, there's a kind of molecule that is called the immune checkpoint molecule. So these molecules can prevent our immune system from overreacting. So for example, uh, if we like frequently overreact our immune system, we may uh, face like the allergic 
reaction that may like cause somebody to die or some very like critical consequences. So like these immune checkpoint molecules are inside our bodies to prevent our immune system from overreacting. However, this like this mechanism may sometimes be hijacked by the tumor cells, which induce that uh, our immune system may not work at all. Like our immune system is suppressed by these IC molecules that uh, our immune system can like no longer work, uh, work effectively to uh, kill the tumor cells when we are facing some like tumors or invasions of other entities. So we use synthesized inhibitors to block the checkpoint molecule, which is the IC block of ICD treatment. So uh, in conclusion, it is actually we can like uh, to stop the suppression of CD8 plus T cells activity or to increase these T cells activity in killing the tumor cells. However, as we remembered before, like CD8 plus T cells must recognize the MHC complex to uh, effectively recognize the tumor cells. So without the MHC protein, uh, there's a kind of tumor cells that is lacking the MHC complex, which is the MHC deficient tumor cells. Uh, the CD8 plus T cells cannot work on those types of tumor cells. Although it has very high activities, ICD treatment cannot work on tumor cells. So uh, in the research paper, the main takeaway is that although ICD treatment cannot work on MHC deficient tumor cells using direct CD8 plus T cells targeting. However, the research found that CD4 plus T cells can solve this problem. So they are not no longer helpers, only helpers anymore. They can uh, work as like super fighters. Can they can uh, attack the tumor cells that even CD8 plus T cells cannot target again. So a contrast experiment was uh, conducted. Like for the MHC expressing tumor cells, a small subset of the CD4 cells can like work by cell dissolving to attack the tumor cells. This is one mechanism for CD4 plus T cells to kill the tumor cells. The second is uh, its most significant way is to like work on MHC deficient tumor cells. It, the CD4 plus T effector cells can help control and collaborate with the myeloid cells to make the tumor cells get sick, therefore indirectly kill the tumor cells. So uh, let's look at how was the research done. So the first two uh, technologies was used by mouse modeling and genetic editing. So the scientists first used CRISPR-Cas9 technology to disrupt the theta gene, which caused like the tumor cells to re uh, result in result to become the uh, MHC type two deficient tumor cells. And uh, the mouse model was chose was chosen in like mouse with melanoma. We know it's a kind of skin cancer tumor that is like happens relatively frequently in human beings. So the researchers discovered that uh, the TRT-1 C4 plus T cells, which is the like the experimental type of CD4 cells used in this experiment, like these cells can actually kill the tumor without the help of the CD8 plus T cells. And a similar experiment was conducted again using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology again to disrupt the JAK1 gene, which uh, like leads to MHC type 1 deficient tumor cells. So like we can cover both the MHC type 1 and MHC type 2 deficient tumor cells, which means that uh, the CD4 can work both uh, on both these two types of deficient, deficiency. So like in this uh, second experiment, we found that CD4 plus T cells can kill these tumors without the help of natural killer cells, which uh, natural killer cells we know is in our innate immune system. So this uh, new type of CD4 plus T cells is very effective. It can 
like without even the need of NK cells and without the need of CD8 plus T cells. So it's very interesting. And uh, another technology was the Incovado 2 photo microscopy. And it's like uh, expressed in like four pictures. So we can see in the right picture, uh, the green one stands for the CD4, CD4 plus T cells and the yellow one stands for the CD8 plus T cells. We may found that the green, green dots are like surround uh, by the stroma surface while uh, for the red dots, the red dots are like a uh, few in all the pictures. So like uh, it has a very constant density. So from these two pictures, uh, we can com compare them and make a conclusion that CD4 plus T cells can independently eradicate tumor cells because we can see that the green dots are like there are relatively uh, very few of them, but a relatively large amount of the red dots. So for the uh, for the green dots, uh, it does not need like the help of the red dots to help it like kill the tumor cells. So it can testify our previous consumption uh, assumption that CD4 plus T cells can actually kill the tumor cells. So here's the last page. Uh, it's my future prospects and some of my thoughts. Um, so like the paper said, the clinical potential is still unknown. So it was not applied to real human patients. So we can hope that it may one day be used as a com complementary method for the uh, existing cancer treatment methods. And the new subset of the CD4 plus T cells can, I think, it can be industrially produced because there are relatively very few CD4 plus uh, effector T cells, which stand only for like 1% of the T cell family. So if it is massively produced, it can like significantly increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the ICD treatment. ICD treatment has already been a very uh, like significant breakthrough of the can cancer treatment history. So with the uh, newly developed CD4 effector T cells uh, production, these treatment can like cure more people than we can ever imagine. So I also think that new researchers need to be done on the mechanism of CD4 plus T cells. How exactly it can kill the tumor that even CD8 plus T cells cannot do it. So it still remains in my mind. And thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Siri, for your presentation. Thank you for your dedication to join us at 4 a.m. Um, um, so does anyone have any questions for Siri? All right. So last but not least, let's welcome Dhruv to talk to us about the forest baby and fight insides. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen really quick. So, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both my research, which involves phytoncides, and I'll get to what those are and how they work a little bit later and also uh, my organization, Forest Harmony, and how we use the principles that we're deriving from our research to help people in their everyday lives. So what is forest bathing? Um, some of you may have heard of this. It's not a super well-known process here in the States, um, but forest bathing is a technique that was derived in Japan in the mid 1980s as a medical technique. Uh, it would actually be prescribed as a medical treatment for high stress, anxiety, and um, people who are generally going through mental health disorders. There are a lot of research benefits to what forced breathing is, including lowered blood, uh, blood pressure, uh, lowered anxiety levels, and increased immune cell counts. This includes cells like natural killer cells um, and some other macrophages. But 
the uh, main thing that forest bathing has and that it uses is there's a class of chemicals known as phytoncides. So phytoncides are naturally uh, used uh, by plants as hormones, exocrine hormones. They are organic chemicals that are used as stress signals for plants, and they promote usually a response in another plant or another organism that would help protect the plant from harmful funguses or growths. Uh, so they, generally speaking, have very good benefits to plants. But as we've done more research, we've looked at uh, how uh, these phytoncides work. We're beginning to understand they also work really well for humans. So like I mentioned on the previous slide, they work well with natural killer cells, blood pressure, and importantly for what I'm gonna be talking about, stress. So I'm sure all of you know, um, especially with everything that's been going on in the world these past few years, stress levels, anxiety levels, all of that has started to increase pretty drastically. And so the hope of my organization, Forest Harmony, was to try and combat that stress by introducing forest bathing to the United States. And the way we do that is we have a few small, short, two-hour sessions in our local area where we invite people to come join us on a guided forest bathing walk where we teach them how to make the most out of their journey by helping them ground themselves in their environment and you know use proper breathing techniques in order to intake the most kind of phytoncides possible and maximize the benefits. Uh, our hope is eventually to try and make it so that these walks are available to everyone across the United States and hopefully outside. But as of right now, we're obviously not a very large organization. So this research was really meant to see two things. And first, that was to try and understand you know, how phytoncides work, and I'll get a little bit more into why we need to understand that in a second. But the other one was to try and give people a easy method of treatment that they can apply in a short amount of time so they don't need to come on long one hour walks. And that can be used by anyone, anywhere at an affordable price. So what we knew about phytoncides mechanism of action at the time that I started this research project was frankly not much. Um, we understood the effects that it had on the body were reduction of cortisol levels, which is a primary stress hormone, and the prior mentioned blood pressure and immune cell counts. However, there was very little research that had been done into the exact mechanism by which these downstream factors were being regulated. Um, the general consensus in the community at the time of me starting this project was that there was one upstream factor that was regulating all of the downstream effects that we were seeing. But even as we did research into a lot of different neurotransmitters and hormones that we thought could have been this upstream factor, we weren't able to conclusively pin down how they were being influenced. And one of the primary neurotransmitters that we uh, were looking at was GABA or gamma immunobutyric acid which is uh, very famously a neurotransmitter known for being an inhibitory, uh, causing inhibitory potentials in neurons. And what that means is it makes a neuron less likely to fire when uh, a GABA neuron has activated near it. So we were hypothesizing that, the, that phytoncides were somehow promoting GABA. And usually the assumption when we're thinking about how phytoncides, you know, or well, how any chemical is affecting a neurotransmitter, we think of them as agonists primarily, uh, thinking that they'll bind to the receptor on the cell surface and cause a reaction within the cell through a signal transduction. But um, the unique approach I wanted to try and take to this was trying to look and see if these phytoncides were really a genetic um, treatment factor. So within our cells, we have transcription factors. And when we are doing the process of transcription, when we're trying to form proteins within our cells, uh, these transcription factors allow RNA polymerase, which is the key enzyme in that transcription process, to bind to, uh, to, bind to our DNA at the correct location and to create the protein. 
So my hypothesis was that this these phytoncides were somehow working as either a transcription factor or making it easier for transcription factors to bind to the RNA uh, to the DNA itself. Sorry, uh, so that we could so that these GABA so that the actual receptors to which GABA attaches were becoming more prominent on the cell surface, making the cell much more sensitive to a GABA signal. Uh, so with phytoncides, we hadn't done much cell level experimentation with them. So there wasn't much data available for me to go off of when I started the research. So this first method, uh, methodology, this first experiment that we had to run was really to get ourselves a baseline of what dosage level would be safe for phytoncides to be experimented with. Uh, so we did a survivability assay, which uh, what we did was we would treat the cells about 24 hours before the measurement time with uh, phytoncides, and then we would let them incubate with the phytoncides in mixture. We treated the cells with a range of different concentrations of these phytoncides. Um, and essentially these would range from having 1% of the medium that they were in being composed of phytoncides all the way down to 0.0001%. So essentially we were just trying to see at what point is, this, uh, is it high enough for, a, for it to be safe for cell experimentation? but also, you know, be reasonable enough to produce a result. So what we would do to measure it is after incubation, we removed the cells and then we would uh, attach a fluorescent dye and we'd incubate again to give it a little bit of time to let the dye, you know, that didn't bind to the cells uh, dissipate. And then we would uh, read the fluorescence of each, like each plate that we had of cells. And that would tell us, you know, the rough concentration of cells that we had in each uh, treatment. So we would be able to see how much these phytoncides were affecting our cell concentrations. And so using the information we determined from that, we ran a QRT-PCR, which is a lot of letters. But essentially what it meant in this situation is that we were trying to see are the when we add phytoncides to the cells, are we seeing an increased amount of any protein production. So during the process of protein production, uh, first RNA has to be translated before anything can be done. And so when you're producing more of a protein, more of that mRNA, that messenger RNA that was created during translation will be present within the cell. So what we did was we treated the um, cells with the phytoncide concentrations that we determined using the previous assay. And well, we incubated the cells and then we would lyse the cells and extract all of the cell components. And we would then isolate RNA using a series of washes with different buffers. And then once we had RNA, uh, we would convert that RNA into a form of DNA called cDNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase. That's what the, uh, and then we'd, um, with that cDNA, we would use a standard PCR procedure with you know specific primers to the GABA receptor genes as well as some fluorescent tags to go with the primers. Um, and then we we uh, let the, you know, we just put them in a thermocycler uh, and measured the, it was a normal quantitative PCR procedure. We put it in a thermocycler and we measured the fluorescent cells. So based off of this, we found, well, uh, we found one, these results are re relatively new. Uh, I got them within like the past month. But what we found was that there is one specific phytoncide uh, that comes from the eucalyptus plant that is specifically able to regulate multiple types of GABA receptors, which is very promising results for us. So essentially what that really means is that these phytoncides could have a massive effect on, you know, these hypertension, lowered immunity. And now that we understand why they work, we can slowly start to use them uh, as a supplementary treatment. And I think the biggest use case for this is with stress. A lot of people, I, I would say it's safe to assume that every single person on the planet experiences some amount of stress every day. But there's a very small portion of that people that actually get to the point that that stress is needed as you know serious medication uh, prescribed by their doctor. But that doesn't mean that only those people are the ones being harmed by stress. A lot of us are still suffering in major ways that are affecting our mental health. And 
really our mental health is just a part of our physical health. So when our mental health and mental wellness are starting to be degraded by the stress, it leaves us more vulnerable to diseases. And stress, in fact, is considered a risk factor for, I believe, around 90% of known human diseases. So the amount of stress that we endure makes us significantly weaker and significantly more prone to certain infections. So using these phytoncides as a supplement for uh, just once a day is essentially what we're envisioning. We're envisioning that they could be used as like a mist. Um, but if you were to use them once a day, we think that at least based on our current research, it would significantly lower the amount of stress you face because those cells in the portion of your brain that experience stress would become sig significantly more sensitive to GABA. So a signal that would normally not be enough to, you know, stop the stress pathway from occurring now becomes all of a sudden much stronger, which makes that threshold of stress needed to, you know, trigger a long, uh, long-term stress action potential much, much higher. So it won't actually harm your stress response when, you know, you're in serious danger. It'll only harm the stress response to things like, you know, everyday stresses that are really just degrading your health. And I mean, what we've done so far is obviously not enough to support every conclusion yet, but we are currently running another round of the PCR at lower concentrations to try and see if we can get that lowest effective dosage. Now that we know that this could be used as a treatment, we want to see what's the lowest dosage size of these phytoncids we could use uh, that would work, because uh, the less foreign material you're introducing into the human body, generally the better. And then once we've done that, we need to tar uh, work with delivery mechanisms that would target specific parts of your brain so that um, when you deliver these phytoncides, they're affecting pretty much only the stress pathway and not causing side effects that we don't want. Because GABA is a pretty universally used neurotransmitter, and we don't want to accidentally sh uh, make cells more sensitive to GABA in a way that would harm the patient. Um, but the, these, this work is much farther down the line, the delivery mechanism work. So right now we're just working on finding that effective dosage. And we'll, we're really, me and my mentor, we're really planning on um, considering that delivery mechanism work uh, maybe a year or two into the future. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you guys for listening to me. Uh, do you have any questions? Hi. Great work. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have uh, two questions. The first question is, uh, in your experiment, which type of cell uh, will be used? Right. So with our experiments, we were limited pretty heavily by budget. So we weren't able to use you know, human cells at all. We used mouse uh, neural cells, specifically the N2A cell line. And that's awesome. what we treated with our price on sets. Nice. Uh, great. And the second question is for the delivery uh, delivery tech you want to use. So do you have any preferences like through skin, through nasal, or digestive tract? Uh, so as of right now, these phytoncides, the way we know, or at least the way that is hypothesized that they work, and a lot of the treatments, like there, there have been a few experiments done with these with regards to like immune cells, which I did talk about a little earlier in this. I think I talked about it very briefly, but in almost all the ways they've been used so far, they've been administered nasally uh, as a mist. So the phytoncides, these phytoncides are oils, and the way that they've been used is you generally just inhale them as either a vapor or a very fine mist, and that causes the effect. In terms of the full system that we'd want to look at, that's still going to require a lot more research on our end into the properties of these phytoncides and just understanding how they generally work. But as of right now, the best I can give you is that we'll probably be experimenting on them as a mist. Awesome. Thank you so much, and good luck for your future experiments. Thank you. Um, I also have a question. So, um, are you able to estimate like a, about how long after the use of like the mist, like how long does the effect last? Right. So actually we have been doing some comparative analysis to look at that. We, when we did the, um, 
PCR, we were actually running two sets of data. So one of them was the treatment lasted for three hours, and then the other lasted for 24 hours. So when we looked at the intervals, the it, uh, we found that there was still a statistically significant regulation on the GABA receptors, although it was a little weaker, at the 24-hour time period. So as of right now, we don't know the upper bound of where how long this would affect, and we're still going to need to determine that. But we know that it would at least last longer than 24 hours. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. All right, so does anyone else have any questions? Okay, thank you, Drew, for your presentation. So that concludes the last of our presentations today. And I believe we've had a really successful symposium. And I would like to thank each of the presenters today for making this event possible. Thank you, first and foremost, to Mr. Wong for giving us a wonderful lecture. And thank you to all the student presenters as well for all your hard work and courage. You guys really had amazing presentations and I also learned a lot today. And thank you to audience members as well for your support for the, presenta for the presenters as well as this event. And I hope everyone enjoyed the symposium and learned something new today. So this brings us to the end of the event. And I would like to say, stay curious, everyone, stay inspired. And to all of our young researchers here today, I best of luck to all your future endeavors and your future academic journey. Thank you, guys.